Good morning. Welcome to Prepare the Way uh, as we minister to you through the Word of God, through spending time uh, just in His Word and in prayer for you. If you've got prayer requests, I hope that you'll send those. Love to pray with you and minister to you in that way. Um, also, want to invite you, as, as always, as we're going through 1 John, uh, if you want to just get your Bible out and sit down with us, uh, and as we talk, you have thoughts, ideas, concepts, questions, uh, please put those in the comment section. If you're on my YouTube channel, send those there, and uh, we can just talk together about about the scripture and what is God saying to us. So if you're able, I hope that you'll join in this as a conversation, as a study together, verse by verse. But let me pray with you. Father, we come to you today uh, thankful for your goodness, for your love. We thank you, Lord God, for this season that we're in, this beautiful fall season. We thank you, Lord God, that uh, that your presence is with us in every season. And Lord, we come to you right now asking that you would lead us, direct us, Lord, in your word. Help us to hear from you and to learn from you. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, pray you'll forgive me for yawning. I'm, I had a great weekend, but a long one, and I'm sleepy. <laughs> but anyway, we're going to... You ever get like that on Monday morning? i if you're watching on Monday morning, get up in the morning and it's, it's been a great weekend. You had a great time at church, had a great time, you know, and those kind of things. And then Monday morning rolls around and it's like, oh, let's get moving. Maybe you're feeling like that today. But well, the Lord's going to wake you up today. Uh, we're in his word. We're in 1 John chapter 2. And our theme is, by this we know. You know, I, I love the reality that God wants us to know him. The whole thing of of the gospel is knowing God and being reconciled to him being at peace with God and with one another and living in his love and in his strength you know the heart of it is the love of God but God wants you to know him and he wants you to know that you know him uh, I, I don't know why uh, some people feel that, that God wants us to not be sure where he is I mean what father would want their child to not be I'm, I'm not so sure you're my child God wants you to know you're his by faith in Jesus Christ. And and John, 1 John is really a manifesto of how do I know that God knows me and that I know him? How can I know that I know that I know that I know that I know him and that he knows me? It's a big difference, friend, between knowing about God and knowing God. And uh, here our goal is to know him. Uh, you know, our Lord is coming back someday, and he's coming back for people that know him and people that he knows through through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's go into his word and find out more and more how we can know that we know that we know him. Now, we're in 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 7. John writes, Beloved, I'm writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment. That which you had from the beginning, the old commandment, is the word that you've heard. You know, um, in our day, unfortunately, old things aren't valued very much. They're, uh, they're cast aside. Um, they're, when, when something gets old, we, we decide that it's less quality. It used to be that, uh, that something was old and meant that it had good quality to it. But today we're throwaway people. We throw away things. We throw people away. We throw relationships away. We throw uh, even old music away. We don't want the old stuff. Give me the new stuff. But there's so many old things that are great to keep. And I, and I, and I, I believe this is, you know, John starts off, this, the commandment I'm writing to you is not a new one. I'm not giving you any new information. This isn't some weird new cult from out in left field. It's the old commandment. The old commandment. You go back to the Old Testament. Everything goes back to this. The, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And then in Leviticus, he says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul tells us in his letters that the, all of the law is summed up in this, love God and love each other. You know, if you could just pull it all, that's been the commandment from the beginning. From the very beginning, God's law has been our roadmap to how to love him and how to love each other. The world, don't ask the world how to define love for you. 
the world is looking for love and the world is trying to create its own version of love and the world falls into confusion and perversion and darkness and and fear and all sorts of things in the quest for love i mean everybody wants to be loved everybody wants to know that they're loved because you were made for that you were made to love and to be loved and the world tries to create its own version of love yet god told us from the beginning let me just tell you how to love each other. Now, so we start off by being reminded that God's command has always been very, very simple. Love God, love each other. But then he goes on in the next verse. He says, at the same time, it is a new commandment that I'm writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. You know, it's saying, well, John's saying, this commandment has been around from the beginning but it is new. It's new because now it's been revealed to us in the person of Jesus Christ. It's new in him is what it says. It's new in him. Jesus Christ came to show us the fullness of what it looks like to love God and love one another. Jesus came ultimately, of course, to die for our sins in the greatest expression of love to overcome sin and death through his death on the cross and his resurrection. But in his earthly life, as he walked around, he showed us what, a, what it looks like when a human being loves God fully and loves one another. Jesus just modeled it for us. That's why as his, his followers, we're called to pursue that same lifestyle. We're not called to, I don't, I don't know why so many people say that they're Christians when they don't love people. I don't know how you're a Christian and don't love people. Years ago, I was horrified to watch this dramatic presentation uh, at a theater. They were exposing white supremacy, and it was these guys who, who were quoting scripture and claiming to be Christian, and how how uh, you know th their whole idea was the promotion of of the of white people over everybody else, and somehow this was supposed to be of Jesus. Jesus doesn't have anything to do with that. Let me just go ahead and tell you. Uh, white supremacy or black supremacy or whatever supremacy you got going on doesn't have anything to do with Jesus because he said to love one another. He said whoever wants to be greatest has got to become your servant. Uh, his love doesn't seek supremacy over others. His love seeks to sacrifice and serve and love and redeem one another and even even redeem creation redeem that that's that's the love of god and that's what we're called to so often religion is misused uh to do just the opposite of what the old commandment is and john says look it's an old commandment it's been around from the beginning but it's a new one because it's new in jesus and in jesus we see it clearly we see exactly what it looks like we see his life of love compassion healing service, strength, holiness, righteousness, justice, all the stuff that he did, all the things that he lived, he was about. He showed us what it looks like. He came to be the object lesson uh, as well as the atoning sacrifice for our sin. He is the object lesson of what love really looks like. And so it is a new commandment in that sense. You know, I, I remember... Uh, you know, sometime, from time to time, somebody will give me an old book. I, you know, preachers are always being given books. And I love the old ones. I love the really old, dusty ones, you know, and they're kind of cool. And, but, you know, when somebody gives you a, 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 a book that's been around for a century, um, but you've never seen it before, it's new to you, right? So it's old and new at the same time. Uh, when the, when a person receives Christ, that, that, that love has been there all along. It's an old love. But then when they receive it, it's, it's brand new. It's, it's so new because it changes everything. And John tells us that, and he goes on to talk about how this love works. He says, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. John sees the kingdom of God coming into the world like a light just exposing the darkness. And, and the darkness of evil and death and sin is passing away. You know, a lot of times we look at the world around us and we look at, at life and we look at the problems of the world, especially today 
uh, with the, the trouble in the Middle East and in Ukraine and, and around the world and, and the people are talking, is World War III coming and are we going to, what's going on? And, and we learn about human trafficking and, and so many things and drug abuse and, and the, the ravages of that. And there's so many things that looks like darkness is, is, is encroaching. But the reality is, ever since Christ rose from the dead, that has been the uh, the judgment against darkness, the final judgment, that darkness ultimately will be destroyed. The kingdom of Satan ultimately will be destroyed. Sadly, there will be people this weekend uh, going out and celebrating horror and death and witchcraft and, and demonic kind of stuff. And, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a time of darkness. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians just jump right in. It's like, yeah, let's let's party with the dark, and and it's kind of a a, a real weird thing going on. And, and people celebrate this, but the fact of the matter is, <clears throat> the devil is, is defeated. Jesus said before he went to the cross, he said, "Now the prince of this world is judged. Um, that Satan's doom is set." And and so what's happening in the world? is light breaking in and, and causing a, a, a disruption of darkness. And so that's why the devil gets all angry, and that's why bad things are, are kicking up, because the devil is, knows that his time is short. Let me read to you in Revelation what it says about that. <clears throat> John writes about this. He says, Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon. And the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated. Underline that. He was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down down who accuses them day and night before our God and they have conquered him by the blood of the lamb by the word of their testimony for they loved not their lives even unto death therefore rejoice O heavens and you who dwell in them but woe to you O earth and the sea for the devil has come to, down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short when the devil looks at, at, at the world, he's not saying that he has a hope of winning. He's, he's a deceiver of nations. Right now, he's got nations deceived into thinking if we, if we just work everything just right, then we can create our own version of peace. We can create our own version of safety. We can create our own world of unity and light, and we can do that. He's deceiving the nations, and, and the nations, of course, are buying into it. They always have. Hook, line, and sinker, they're just kind of going with it. But the devil knows in his heart that his time is short. They, I used to hear an old saying that whenever the devil tries to remind you of your past, you just remind him of his future. His doom is set. His time is short. Whatever you're going through right now, whatever darkness you're aware of or is, is encroaching in your life right now, understand that it is temporary. Ultimately, it shall be destroyed. If you're being ravaged by death around you, if you're seeing violence, if you're seeing darkness and fear and oppression, know that its days are numbered. The true light is already shining. And wherever the gospel goes, wherever the gospel goes, the victory of God over darkness shines bright. And so that's why we hold on to him. That's why we trust in him. Because he has already overcome the darkness. And, and the devil is defeated. And I, I think you ought to just say that. And, and whatever you're facing in life, instead of going around uh, announcing all the work the devil's doing, you ought to shift it over and start announcing the goodness of God and the greatness of God, even in the midst of your trial. Instead of bragging on the devil, brag on God because he has overcome the darkness and, and he will ultimately destroy it. The Bible says the last enemy to be defeated is death. Uh, if you're dealing with grief and sorrow and death, know that death, even death, will end one day. It could happen any day. 
but so so John goes on now. Now he he says all this stuff about the light coming in. But here's the thing: there's an implication for us and for how we live in light of that. We you know we we praise God and we're thankful that the devil's defeated. We're thankful that darkness is passing away. Even as we speak, the darkness is passing away. But how do we live in light of that? John always wants to get us to, okay, now, what do we do about this? And here's what he says. He says in verse 9, Whoever says he's in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. There are many people who would say that they agree that the darkness has been overcome, but they still hate people. You're still carrying bitterness and, and, and resentment and unforgiveness and anger and hostility toward people. He says, you're still in the dark if you're living in hate. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there's no cause for stumbling. You know, love is the light that guides us through life. And if I live by the light of the love of God, I won't stumble. It's, it's the person that lives in hate that stumbles. That's what he says next. He says, but whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You know, the Bible tells us that, that walking in hate is a, is a perilous walk in the dark and we, we trip over things. We trip over opportunities that we miss because we're so angry. We trip over uh, relationships that remain broken because we walk in hatred and darkness. We, uh, we, we get angry with somebody and we stay bitter at that person. And, then, and we, we stumble all around them instead of getting to know that person and love and appreciate them. We fall into hate, anger, jealousy, bitterness, and envy, and revenge, and all these kinds of things. Many people listening to me today are caught up. In revenge, you, you, somebody has hurt you, and you're just you're holding that against them, and you're holding that grudge. But what happens when you hold a grudge is it blinds you to the things that God wants to do in your life because you're so consumed by it. I think of Herodias, the uh, the uh, illegitimate wife of John of King Herod, when John the Baptist had told Herod, "You cannot live with your brother's wife." She hated John the Baptist for saying that, and she wanted him dead. And one day Herodias' daughter was given the opportunity of a lifetime. The king said to her, I will give you anything you want up to half of my kingdom. And she ran to her mother and said, Mom, I've got the opportunity of a lifetime. What should I ask for? And Mom could have said something like, Well, honey, this is a great opportunity for you. Why don't you ask for half the kingdom? Why don't you become queen of half of the kingdom of Israel right now? This is a wonderful opportunity for you. But her mom was so blinded by hate that she could not see the opportunity for her daughter. And she says, oh, tell him to bring me the head of John the Baptist on a plate. I want to ask you, which would you rather have? A dead man's head on a plate or half of a kingdom? This opportunity was right in front of her. But she couldn't see it. She was so blinded by hate. And I think people do that today all the time. There are people, God offers you the kingdom. He's offering you kingdom opportunities. He's offering you kingdom uh, chances to do great things. But you're so blinded by your hate of somebody. You're so angry at somebody. So busy being bitter that you can't see the opportunity God's put right in front of you. That's what it means when it says whoever lives in hate. It stumbles through life. You stumble through. Uh, drunk on your own anger and hostility, and you can't see. And God brings things into your life, and you can't even see those things um, because you're full of hate. You know, there comes a time when you have to say to yourself, holding on to this grudge isn't working. It's not helping. It's not getting me where God wants me to be. And, and sometimes we, we feel like we're, and the devil loves to deceive you into thinking you're actually accomplishing something by holding a grudge. The devil wants you to think you're being strong because you're going to never forgive that person and you're going to hold on to them and buddy, you're just going to let them know just how much you don't like them and, you know, but you're the only one losing sleep over it. You're the only one losing opportunities over it. You're the only one walking in darkness over it. You're the one that's suffering because you won't release it. Now here's the thing. 
God is light, and there, in him there's no darkness at all. And when you forgive somebody, you release justice into the hands of God. And the Bible says, justice is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. If there's any justice to be done, let God take care of it. You're terrible at it. God's good at it, and he'll do it the right way. God also brings justice with mercy because he wants to bring everybody to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so here's the thing. Are you going to allow your heart to remain darkened? Are you going to keep hoping that person gets what they've got coming? Are you going to keep finding ways to undermine that person and to let everybody know how bad they are? And you might be absolutely right. That person may be a real crumb. I mean, they may be a, a complete dog. But you know what? <clears throat> Allowing yourself to live in that kind of hate is just going to make life dark. It's going to make it dark here and in eternity because you can't love God and hate your brother at the same time. Uh, and so here's the thing, that <clears throat> whoever walks in hate walks in darkness, and you can't even see where you're going because darkness blinds your eyes. Now John stops, and he he writes this this. Uh, this, this statement here, I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I'm writing to you fathers because you know him who's from the beginning. I'm right, and he says it again, I'm writing to you young men for you have overcome the little children. I'm right, the evil, I'm sorry, you've overcome the evil one. I'm writing you little children because you know the father. I write to you fathers because you know him who's from the beginning. I write to you young men because you're strong and the word of God abides in you. And you've overcome the evil one. And what, what John is saying is, like, guys, the stuff I'm telling you, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. That's, that's where John really gets us here. He, he says, look, everything I've told you, you, you already know this. You've already, you know, he's writing to believers, by the way. He's writing to Christians. And he's saying, look, if you walk in hate, you're walking in dark. If you walk in love, you walk in the light. And you get to choose which of those you do. And he says, young men, come on, you know this is true. Old men, you know this is true. And, and walk in it. Walk in the light. Walk in the light of the love of God. And, uh, you know, I, I really believe that God wants us today to think about what we're walking in. This is an old commandment. From the beginning of time, love has been the answer. The love of God in Jesus Christ. At the same time, it's a new commandment because in Jesus, we see clearly how to live that love out. We see clearly how to really walk in love toward one another. That's why Paul wrote in Ephesians 5, he says, be imitators of Christ and walk in love as beloved children. And we're called to walk this way. Um, if your religion if your faith is leading you to hate anybody, I mean, we are to hate evil, absolutely. We are hate sin, hate immorality, hate violence, hate pride, hate greed, hate those things. But it never says to hate the people doing them. We're called to love people, and everybody is included in that. I love what Ruth said here on this on this uh, comment. She said, you know, love includes everybody, no matter what level you're on. Young men, old men, young men, old young women, old women. It doesn't matter who you are. We're all called to walk in the love of God. And God's love is available to you through Jesus. Now, Jesus clarifies what love is. And so, again, we don't fall for the cheap imitations of love out in the world. Um, it's not enough to say all religions talk about love. Well, they do, but they have concepts about love that often are, are not in line with who God is and in line with who Jesus is. That's why Jesus is the light of the world. He says, whoever follows me will, walk, will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. It's love must be defined by Jesus, the Son of God, who died on the cross, rose from the dead on the third day, and who invites us to turn from our darkness, to turn from our unforgiveness, to turn from our jealousy, our envy, our hostility, and turn to him. In this world, those things, jealousy, hatred, revenge, are seen as strengths. But in the kingdom of God, they're blinders. They keep you from seeing what life is really about. 
you know, you see a couple going through a divorce and they can get so angry with one another that the children are just ignored. They're, they're, the children are sometimes used as pawns in a custody battle uh, because one person wants to have control and the other person, and, and sometimes it can be this terrible fight and, this, and they get so angry. And this doesn't happen in every situation, but a lot of times it does. They get so angry with one another that the children are neglected. The children suffer the most because because of that. When, when war happens, I mean, look at war. Uh, the horrible thing about war, the thing that's so evil about war is that it's usually the innocent people that suffer. Uh, while the people who started the war sit in cozy, comfortable office chairs and make decisions. And then it's the people who didn't want the war in the first place who end up being devastated by it. You see, when you're in darkness, uh, you get blind to what to other people's needs. You get blind to what matters to other people, and you're just thinking about yourself all the time. It happens in office politics. It happens in our political system right now. I think our political system is so blinded by rage and hate that, uh, and I hope that's passing away, but it's so blinded that, that people are passing laws and things and fighting and just to get each other. And it's like, what? Is there a country out there? Are there people out there? No, there's just us. Let's fight. And so, and it's just crazy sometimes, right? Because that's what happens when you walk in the darkness of hate and resentment and bitterness and jealousy. You can't see what's important. You can't see what really matters. I want to ask you today, what are you mad about today? Can I just be blunt? What are you so mad about? And, and, Take that to God today. What are you mad about? You know, he wants to hear it. He wants you to talk to him. Because if you bring that to him, he can help you resolve it. He can help you find freedom and forgiveness. Or you can continue down the path of anger and hostility. I mean, we're, we're in a day when so many people are angry, don't even know why they're angry anymore. They don't, they don't even know why they're mad. And, uh, and because we've been trained to, to be divided to, against each other and to fight each other, resent each other, be suspicious of each other, not trust each other. And I think that really is the devil's attempt to make everybody isolated. If you really want to control people, isolate them. Get them, get them off to themselves. Um, and I think that there are people in power who are wanting to do that. They want to have control. And so what they try to do is get people alienated from each other. It's easier to control people when they're all separate. But when people come together, then there's, some, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's a formidable foe. And so I believe the devil does it. And I believe people in power do it. I believe some, some of us do it. When you get mad, what do you first thing you try to do is, is get people mad at each other in order to, to solve the drama that's going on in your life. This is not this is not how God calls us to live. He calls us to live in the love of in His love, and sometimes that's painful. Sometimes that's sacrificial. Sometimes that means is confrontational, but sometimes but it always involves forgiveness and mercy at the end of the day. Jesus came to show us how to love one another. Can you can you let it go today? Can you go to God today and bring those angry thoughts to Him, those angry feelings, and say, God, here's what here's what's going on, and and that, I'm not saying they're not legitimate. Bring them to the God of justice and the God of righteousness. Bring forgiveness. Be willing to let go of the past, willing to let go of the offenses, and allow God to bring healing into your heart. You know, it's the light of His redeeming love that that sets us free when we when we're really willing to forgive somebody we're willing to apologize to somebody we're willing to show a little more patience with somebody we're willing to just back up and take a breath and say god help me to walk in your kindness your mercy today uh, even when people are wrong me help me to love my enemy today help me to pray for those who persecute me today can we do that today this is what he commands us to do because this is the way to live this is where real joy happens. And so God's calling you today to make this decision. Am I going to walk in the darkness of continued bitterness and resentment and anger and hostility? Or am I going to let those things be released into the hands of God and walk in the love and forgiveness and mercy that will light my way? This is your choice today. Father, thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Lord, that the true light is already shining. The darkness is passing away. Uh, the devil's destiny is set. 
uh, the destiny of darkness and evil are set. There's no, there's no uh, chance for the, the devil to win. Um, hatred does not win. Jealousy does not win. Uh, bitterness does not win. Lord, love wins. Forgiveness wins. Mercy wins. Truth wins in Jesus. Lord, help us today to walk in the light as you are in the light and to forsake the darkness, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Go in peace.